so, uh, and if you look month on month, which the, is the other way of looking at sequentially at uh, uh, incoming information, then you have too much volatility. So we, we do this by uh, using three month moving averages. And there we see uh, uh, either a pickup or a fairly strong growth for some of the indicators. For example, infrastructure investment continues to be really strong. Private investment has picked up a bit, and a number of other indicators have also been so imports have surged, for example, in the, in the first two months of this year. Uh, stepping back a bit and looking at a longer perspective, we see that uh, productivity growth has slowed down in, in China. And this is a problem if uh, China wants to maintain growth uh, at, at high rates and to achieve its target of doubling GDP per capita during the 2010s. Uh, uh, given that the, uh, on the labor input side there will be more and more demographic drag going forward and that sheer capital accumulation cannot do it uh, anymore. If we look at the, the I-core, which is the incremental capital output ratio, we see that the efficiency of e every extra unit of investment is declining over time uh, for e e any extra unit of credit and, and investment. You get less GDP because it's less efficient uh, uh, these days. So something has to be done to uh, revive productivity growth. Uh, and China is trying uh, by spending a lot of money on R&D. Uh, uh, this will be developed by, by Margaret uh, at length because it's at the core of the chapter on innovation and corporate performance. Here I just want to highlight that China is spending now 2% of GDP, which is quite a lot for countries in this category of GDP per capita, although uh, less than, than US, Japan or, or Korea. But there is an issue of quality, uh, as Margaret will develop. Uh, another important trend is the rebalancing that uh, the leaders have been talking about for a while in, in China. And rebalancing has several dimensions. One of the dimensions is a composition of GDP with a shift from manufacturing to services. And there, uh, in the data, which uh, should be treated with a bit of caution, because services in the Chinese uh, classification also include construction. And construction, we know that the, there are some issues there in China. But uh, nevertheless, uh, there is a clear uh, shift from, from manufacturing to services. You also see it in the employment data on the right-hand side. And the employment data have been pretty strong. Job creation in China has surprised uh, on the upside with 13 million new urban jobs created every year over the past three years, uh, well above the uh, target of 10 million. Uh, leading, in fact, uh, uh, the policymakers to revise their target for this year to 11 million. Uh, and uh, this is important for, for social inclusion. However, there is a lot of disparity across uh, uh, regions and cities uh, in China uh, as with respect to labor market conditions. As you can see on the right-hand side, uh, in the Rust Belt areas, such as uh, Shenyang, uh, uh, the uh, uh, situation is not as good as in some of the more dynamic uh, big cities. Uh, this uh, underlies that uh, uh, investment, which we saw has become less, less efficient, has also slowed down quite a bit. This is part of rebalancing. Uh, but the slowdown is not uniform across the provinces. One of the things we try to document when we can in our reports is how diverse the Chinese economy is. Uh, when we uh, visit uh, Chinese provinces, as we do for every single report. Uh, for this one, we went to Hohot in Mongolia, and we went to Shenzhen and uh, Guangzhou and uh, Zhaoqing uh, in Guangdong province. Uh, every time we land somewhere, we realize uh, this place is, this province is bigger than uh, most of the European countries, and <laughs> it's very different from the other province we, we come from. So uh, we always try to underline the contrasts. Uh, and, here, one of the interesting uh, uh, numbers is Lyoning. Uh, I should point out that the number for Lyoning here is the official number that was published uh, until a, a few months ago. And, and we know, you may have seen in the press reports, of uh, uh, Lyoning officials confessing to uh, faking the data big time. So in fact, it's, it's much worse than what you see on this picture for Lyoning. Uh, another aspect of rebalancing is uh, consumption. Consumption, as you can see, uh, is contributing between 4 and 6 percent uh, touch points to, to GDP growth uh, fairly steadily with some uh, volatility over time. But it, it, as growth slow down, overall GDP growth, the, the contribution of consumption uh, stays in that range, which is a good sign, and which is linked to continued urbanization. Uh, 
the government has a target uh, in the 13th five-year plan of 60% urbanization by 2020, which should be easily reached on, the, on current trends. However, for this to support consumption, as is the intent, uh, we need uh, uh, further improvements in the social safety net. Otherwise, the saving rate will remain uh, ex extremely high. Uh, households will continue to have very high precautionary savings uh, and to, to refrain from, from consu consuming. Uh, an aspect of the report that uh, uh, is a bit uh, new compared to earlier reports is uh, the uh, apparent uh, uh, change in trend with respect to openness. We, we were used to China, uh, China Chinese trade expanding very fast year after year and to uh, uh, openness increasing over time. And here, if you look at some of the indicators, we see a reversal, which uh, may be linked to the fact that China is moving up uh, the global value chains and uh, onshoring some activities that uh, heretofore were done uh, partly uh, in the US, for example, if we think about some I IT uh, components. Turning now to macro policies, uh, first monetary policy has been quite supportive uh, over the past uh, year or so, uh, at least until very recently. Uh, they cut uh, the reserve requirement uh, in steps. Uh, I say they rather than the PBOC, since we know that monetary policy is not uh, really decided by the PBOC itself. Uh, at the same time, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, policy uh, targeted lending. Uh, so this is something that is a bit harder to measure, but there are a lot of facilities in the PBOC arsenal that have been used uh, to uh, uh, push a credit to selected uh, sectors. And one of the recommendations we have in the report is to rely more on market-based uh, uh, monetary instruments uh, and a bit less on these discretionary uh, tools. Uh, in fact, there's a very recent uh, working paper published by the PBOC research team themselves, which discusses uh, transparency of monetary policy making and uh, uh, whether uh, there isn't a, a case to be made against excessive uh, ambiguity, because it's very hard to read what's really going on when the PBOC can pull all these different levers in more or less opaque ways, and market participants have a hard time figuring out if policy is really tightening or what, what is going on. Uh, this is just one illustration that the liquidity growth has been extremely rapid in the course of 2016, and there have been some efforts to restrain liquidity growth against the backdrop of a, a meltdown in the foreign exchange mountain, which has shrunk from uh, 4 trillion uh, US dollars to, to 3 trillion, and 3 trillion seems to be the new uh, sacred uh, number uh, the latest uh, number is February, and, and there there's a slight increase in the, the foreign exchange uh, reserves number, but this partly reflects the uh, valuation effects since uh, uh, when you have movements, uh, uh, currency movements, uh, and the, the composition of the reserves uh, is such that uh, uh, the value in U.S. dollar terms of the, of the reserve may increase, even though reserve had not increased the label in another currency. But anyhow, the, the, the point is they, they, they are trying to now discourage some of the capital outflows uh, in order uh, to limit the depletion of the, the Forex reserves. And uh, at the same time, we have a, a, a quite remarkable change in the exchange rate trend. We were used for many years uh, uh, to see a, a trend appreciation of the RMB in effective uh, real terms. Uh, this has uh, stopped uh, a year or a year and a half ago, although it, uh, it, there has been some stabilization in recent months. This is a slide, a picture taken uh, just uh, less than a week ago at the China Development Forum, where Margaret and I were uh, this weekend. Uh, we had the head of SAFE, the uh, State Administration for Foreign Exchange, who made a long presentation. And one of the key points he was making is that it was important to uh, restrain or uh, forbid some of the capital outflows that were not uh, uh, warranted. And he took as an example the purchase uh, of a number of football clubs uh, by Chinese uh, entities in the course of recent months, also the odd basketball club. Uh, so he had this slide, which was the one that provoked most loss on the part of the audience. Uh, uh, which meant to say that uh, uh, there will be indeed uh, moral suasion or guidance, or however you want to call it, uh, with respect to, to capital outflows uh, in the coming months. Uh, uh, just a picture about inflation, since we talk about monetary policy. Uh, 
PPI inflation has really uh, changed course dramatically after uh, four or five years of negative numbers in the minus three, minus four range. Uh, we have seen an acceleration in PPI inflation to close to 8% on the latest readings. Uh, however, this has not uh, filtered through to CPI inflation. In fact, the latest reading of CPI is very low at 0.8 for February, partly re reflecting the base effect, so it, we shouldn't read too much in it, uh, partly reflecting food price volatility. But uh, core CPI inflation, which is probably more relevant uh, for analytical purposes and to uh, uh, assess uh, inflationary pressures, is well behaved at around 2%. Uh, so there's no real inflation issue. The target of the PBOC, or of the authorities rather, is uh, 3% again this year. So if core is running at around 2, there's no uh, uh, immediate inflationary threat. On the fiscal side, the policy has also been uh, very active to support growth uh, uh, last year and remains quite uh, supportive uh, this year as well. It, it's hard to measure the fiscal deficit accurately, uh, each uh, institution seems to have its own measure of the fiscal deficit. We have two in our report. We could present more, but we, we restrained ourselves and, and showed two, two measures. The IMF uh, has long had a, a rather different measure and then revised its measure. And then investment banks each seem to have their uh, homemade uh, measure. Uh, whatever the measure, what is clear is that there has been fiscal stimulus uh, uh, in various forms, uh, including in the form of lending by the, the policy banks. But there, there is clearly a need for more transparency uh, um, in the fiscal numbers. This is one of our recommendations that uh, it's, it would be important, uh, like for monetary policy, to be able uh, to have a, a more accurate, real-time reading of the policy stance. Uh, the report uh, focuses quite a bit on the risks uh, that surround this outlook and the vulnerabilities. And of course, this is something that the uh, Chinese leadership is very well aware of. If you read the report uh, that uh, Li Qichang gave on the 5th of March, he uh, is quite uh, explicit about the various financial risks uh, that, that are uh, there, and there are efforts made to, to, to contain those risks. Uh, one of these risks is housing prices. Uh, this is something that's in every Chinese newspaper, it seems, every day. Uh, uh, there has been really an exuberant growth uh, last year. In sequential terms, this has uh, uh, slowed down quite a bit partly reflecting measures that have been taken in a large number of cities by now to uh, limit uh, demand. Uh, for example, in Beijing, they have tightened the, the rules on down payment for uh, the purchase of uh, second homes, so we're raising it from 50% to 60%. Uh, but this kind of price growth is, is a problem. I would just add that it's not just a problem in China. In a number of OECD countries, after years of very low interest rates, we have uh, overheated housing markets. Uh, so in Sweden, for example, which is one of the countries in my division, uh, the single biggest risk is probably the housing market bubble. Uh, this is just to, to show that uh, in, in line with this increase in prices, mortgage credit has also increased very much, uh, even though uh, in overall terms, uh, household indebtedness uh, uh, that remains, in international comparison, fairly low, and prudential rules fairly strict in China. Uh, corporate debt is uh, an issue that the market will say more about, but it's clearly one, one big risk with uh, corporate debt having reached levels uh, far above uh, international uh, comparators uh, in China, and most of this being SOE debt. You can see it in bank balance sheets as well. Uh, we know that NPLs are understated in the official numbers, but they are, they are rising, so there is a, a disquieting trend. And near NPLs, so to speak, or uh, special mention loans, to use the, the technical term, are also rising fast. Uh, so uh, there is a deterioration in the quality of the portfolio of banks corresponding to this excessive corporate indebtedness. Uh, I should speed up, otherwise I will crowd out the uh, uh, market. Uh, but uh, I, I do want to say just in, in a few words uh, that uh, there is an issue of fiscal uh, uh, organization, a mismatch between uh, revenue intake and uh, spending mandates uh, between levels of government. And so uh, local governments find themselves uh, uh, short of resources to finance some of the things they're supposed to finance and uh, reliant too much on uh, land rights sales, as you can see on this chart. 
the share of land right sale revenue to total revenue for some provinces is just very, very high. And this is not, uh, not healthy. Uh, uh, one, one way to cope with this is to set up platforms. Uh, so there are about 17,000 uh, such uh, special vehicles, uh, according to one estimate. Uh, the National Audit Office has uh, investigated this in depth, but doesn't do so regularly. So the latest audit dates back several years now. And it's a, it's a source of financial risk. Uh, one of the things the authorities are doing is trying to redesign uh, the uh, prudential framework. Uh, in December 2015, there was the so-called macro policy assessment introduced by the PBOC, which is going to be revamped uh, later this month or uh, next month, uh, adding uh, wealth management products to shadow banking as items that will be monitored more closely by the central bank. And uh, the regulatory setup may also be streamlined and reinforced along the lines depicted here, although this is just one scenario envisaged uh, by HSBC. There are other possibilities. Um, I will perhaps just flag uh, that uh, we have some material in the report also on green growth at the OECD. We, we try to underline the need for sustainable uh, development. And uh, although the government likes to, to show, this is the NDRC uh, report that presented on March the 5th, that uh, they are making progress reducing uh, the toxicity of uh, each unit of GDP. Uh, given that GDP continues to grow fast, in absolute terms, uh, emissions of uh, bad stuff uh, in the air, the water, and the soil continue to, to rise. Uh, this is one example with the quality of air, where you see that China doesn't compare very well, although uh, India is even worse. But that's, that's called comfort. Uh, the recommend, we have several recommendations. One of them is to increase the share of environmental taxes in, in the tax mix. And the other is to uh, enforce uh, uh, environmental legislation more uh, resolutely uh, at the subnational level. So I will stop here to possible to my This is just a few headlines triggered by, by our report. As you can see, there's a lot of focus on the growth numbers, but the growth numbers are not what is most interesting in, in the OCD uh, survey.